The Industrial Revolution, Part 1. The Industrial Revolution was a major turning point in the history of civilization. This historical event radically changed the ways people had made things for centuries. This period of sudden and rapid change occurred during the 18th and 19th centuries, with most of the changes occurring between 1750 and 1850. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, most people lived on farms in rural areas. The way of life was hard and living conditions were harsh. Homes were poorly heated and without running water. Water was generally obtained from nearby streams or wells outside the houses. Lighting was poor and consisted of candles or light from a burning fireplace. Indoor plumbing was non-existent and the toilets were located outdoors. It was a common practice to keep a container near the bed, which was used in case of an emergency during the night. People produced most of the food that they consumed. This activity usually involved all the family and took a major part of the working day. Many times grain was stored in lofts above the sleeping area. Most people also generally made all of their clothes, as ready-made clothes were not always available, and those that were could be afforded only by the very rich. Before the Industrial Revolution, a person's ability to transform the surroundings into something useful on a large scale was greatly limited. Most tools and products constructed before the Industrial Revolution were made individually by hand, or with the aid of very simple machines. Factories, as we know them today, did not exist. What manufacturing that did occur took place in homes or in small shops in the cities. Manufacturing done in the homes was known as a domestic or cottage industry. Under this system of production, merchants brought raw materials to the homes of the workers where the materials were turned into finished goods. The workers were paid by the number of pieces they produced. This type of an arrangement suited the cottage workers, who were mostly housewives, in that they did not have to leave their homes to work. And their work could be done at their convenience and could be scheduled around other household chores. Although there were some mutual advantages of the cottage industry for both the merchant and the worker, this system of manufacturing was greatly limited in the type and quantity of goods that could be produced. Such a system could never be organized to efficiently produce goods in mass quantities or to produce anything except the simplest of items. Cottage industries still operate in many of the lesser developed countries of the world today. Goods produced in shops like this one generally involved metal or wood, whereas most cottage industries involved spinning, weaving, or working with cloth. Most workers in city shops were men who belonged to organizations called guilds. A guild was an organization of men in the same craft or trade who united to protect their members and to uphold standards of quality. The Industrial Revolution took cottage workers out of their homes and craftsmen out of their shops and placed them in factories to operate larger and more efficient power-driven machines. England is considered the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. The period that historians call the Industrial Revolution began in the 1700s. During this period, England possessed the five conditions necessary for a revolution in industry to occur. These were, one, good natural resources. Coal and iron ore deposits were plentiful and a mild climate existed. Swift flowing rivers to provide power were present. Natural harbors provided the means to move raw materials into England and finished goods out of England. Number two, a large labor force. 
agricultural advances had led to a great increase in food production. This in turn led to an increase in population, which resulted in more people being available to work in factories. Number three, the availability of capital. A reliable source of capital was necessary to ensure the expansion of industry. England had been increasing its capital from domestic and overseas trade for centuries. Therefore, money was available to build machines and factories. Number four, the availability of markets. Since the British had colonies around the world, ready-made markets existed for finished products of the Industrial Revolution. Also, the British themselves needed more food, clothing, and household items as a result of a population increase. Number five, a favorable government. English laws regarding land holdings made possible the building of roads and canals. Patents were granted to encourage inventions. And taxes were lowered on profits made from industries. This region in Shropshire, along the Severn River, is often called the Cradle of Industrialization. Here, in an area three miles long, known as the Iron Bridge Gorge, stands the most important industrial archaeological site in Britain. This area, which portrays the early days of the Industrial Revolution, has been designated a World Heritage Site by the United Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization. There are six main museum sites where visitors may see what life was like during this period and how important changes took place. The six museum sites include the Museum Visitors Center, which provides an introduction to the history of industrial development within the gorge. The Colebrookdale Furnace and Museum of Iron portrays iron as one of the foundations of modern civilization. The site was the most important iron-making center in the world in the 18th century. Here, the history of iron-making and the story of the Colebrookdale Company are illustrated. The Iron Bridge and Toll House Museum houses displays illustrating the history and construction of the Iron Bridge, which pioneered the use of cast iron for major construction purposes. The Coalport China Museum demonstrates how porcelain was made on this site in 1790. Throughout the 19th century, the Coalport China Works was one of the largest and most celebrated producers of porcelain in the world. Today, workers demonstrate the techniques that were once used to make porcelain ornaments. The Jackfield Tile Museum houses an extensive display illustrating the design and manufacture of tiles. In the 19th century, decorative tiles were made and shipped to all parts of the world to enhance the appearance of churches, hotels, railway stations, shops, and parliament buildings. The Blist Hill Open Air Museum is located on 50 acres and shows how people lived and worked in the 19th century utilizing the technologies developed by a century of industrial growth. In addition to an abundant supply of water, this region had large deposits of coal and iron ore, the two natural resources on which early industrialization depended. Coal was needed to make iron and provide power to drive steam engines like this one, which was used to pull small carts filled with coal from mine shafts as deep as 400 feet in the earth. Iron was needed to make machines and tools to build bridges, ships, and trains. In the Iron Bridge Gorge, innovations occurred in the manufacture and use of iron, which made possible the Industrial Revolution. It was here in 1709 that Abraham Darby first smelted iron using coke made from coal as a fuel instead of charcoal made from wood. Smelting is the process of extracting impurities from iron ore to make pure metal. 
Although the smelting of iron had been done for centuries, the process of using charcoal made from hardwood lacked enough oxygen to burn completely. This resulted in a poor quality iron. In this original furnace, coke was made by heating coal in an airtight oven to burn up the gases in the coal and leaving a product of almost pure carbon. The making of iron by using coke was much more economical and efficient than by making it with charcoal. Another reason that coal played such an important part in the making of iron was that by the time the Industrial Revolution began, Britain had used up most of its hardwood forests and charcoal became so expensive that many iron making sites were forced to shut down. This building at Colebrookdale, an area in the Iron Bridge Gorge, houses the original furnace used by Darby in 1709 to first successfully smelt iron using coke. Although the original furnace is not in operation, a working model in the Museum of Iron illustrates how the furnace functioned. Coal, limestone, and iron ore were all necessary for the smelting of iron. Coke taken from coke hearths was placed in the bottom of the furnace through an opening in the top. Next, a layer of limestone was placed on the coke, followed by a layer of iron ore. The furnace bellows were powered by a water wheel. Air from the bellows flowed into the furnace, which supplied enough oxygen to produce a very hot fire. As the heat increased, the droplets of iron would trickle to the bottom. The limestone would also melt and float to the top, taking with it many impurities in the ore and the coke. The molten limestone would be thrown away. When it cooled, it would form a substance known as slag. The molten iron would be allowed to flow out from the bottom of the furnace into cubicles of sand known as pig beds. When the iron cooled enough to harden, the pig iron was taken from the sand and then shipped to other foundries throughout the world where they would be remelted and cast into useful objects. In some cases, the molten iron was taken from the blast furnace and ladled into molds to make castings. Many new and useful objects began to appear as a result of this manufacturing process. Cast iron stoves used for cooking and heating, large pots for heating water, as well as power-driven machines were soon commonplace. The first iron wheels, which were used in the local coal mines, were cast at Colebrookdale in 1729. The wheels were attached to small carts, which made the movement of coal from the mines much easier. Iron rails were cast in 1767 as a companion to iron wheels. This further sped up the transporting of materials of all kinds. The furnaces at Colebrookdale began using so much coal and iron ore that the ferry across the Severn River could not keep up with the demand. Therefore, Abraham Darby III, the grandson of Abraham Darby, decided to build a bridge across the gorge. The original design for the bridge was by Thomas Pritchard, a Shrewsbury architect. In 1777, Darby had the original furnace at Colebrookdale enlarged to increase its capacity to produce the vast amount of iron needed for the bridge. Thus, the first iron bridge in the world was cast at Colebrookdale in 1779 and opened to traffic on New Year's Day in 1781. A toll was charged to use the bridge and the original table of toll charges may be seen on the wall of the toll house. There are 380 tons of iron in the bridge, which has a center span of 100 feet and a total length of 200 feet. The bridge was put together using carpenter joints rather than bolts or rivets. This was the first time that iron was used in the architectural design of a structure. The bridge stands today as a symbol of the Industrial Revolution and the source of the name for this World Heritage Site. The textile industry played a major part in the Industrial Revolution and was the first to benefit from the advances made in transportation and iron making.
It was the leader of industrial changes in the 18th century. Power-driven machines were introduced into the textile mills beginning in 1750. The bringing together of power machines and workers marked the beginning of the modern factory. For centuries prior to the Industrial Revolution, spinning had been done in the home on a simple machine called a spinning wheel. Powered by a foot pedal, the spinning wheel produced only one thread at a time. Before the material could be turned into thread on a spinning wheel, it first had to be carded, a process to arrange the fibers lengthwise and prepare them for spinning. Many times this job was done by children. In 1738, John Wyatt patented a roller spinning machine. This was the first step in the industrialization of the textile industry. Slowness in developing an adequate spinning machine held back the early development of the cotton industry. At one time, it took from three to 20 spinners to produce enough yarn for one weaver, depending upon the finished cloth and the type of fiber involved. The spinning jenny, seen here, was invented by James Hargreaves in 1764. Like the original spinning wheel, it was powered by the spinner turning the wheel. The innovation was that one operator could now spin a number of threads at once. By 1788, there were some 20,000 of these jennies in use. The first spinning jenny had only eight spindles, Whereas, 20 years later, some jennies had as many as 80 spindles. The next major improvement in textile manufacturing was the water frame, invented and patented by Richard Arkwright in 1769. It was called a water frame because it received its source of power from water. Arkwright's water frame produced stronger yarn and was a significant invention because, for the first time in the textile industry, spinning was taken out of the cottage. The world's first successful water-powered cotton spinning mill was built in 1771 by Arkwright at Cromford in Derbyshire. He developed one of the first industrial villages, including workers' cottages, a marketplace, and a lockup. Arkwright's mill, with its water-powered machinery and large workforce, became the model for others throughout the world and earned him the title Father of the Factory System. In 1779, Samuel Crompton invented the spinning mule, which combined the features of the spinning jenny and the water frame. Crompton's mule produced unusually fine yarn, which permitted British weavers to compete with the high-quality calico and muslin cloths being imported from India. The particularly efficient spinning mule eventually replaced both the spinning jenny and the water frame. The first textile mills appeared in England in the 1740s, and by 1780 there were over a hundred in existence with several more in Scotland. Most of the cotton used in the textile mills of England came from the United States. At one time, 90% of all cotton grown in the United States was imported at these docks in Liverpool, England. By 1790, the problem of supplying adequate quantities of yarn had been solved. Spinners could now produce more yarn than the weavers could use, and thus weaving became the bottleneck for the textile industry. Practically all weaving prior to the early 1800s was done on hand looms. No one had been able to solve the problems of mechanical weaving. Weaving by hand was a slow and tedious task, and the yarn spun by machines at the early mills had to be put out for weaving. The first attempt to mechanize weaving was done by John Kay, who invented the flying shuttle in 1733. The flying shuttle was a simple mechanical device attachable to a hand loom. This sped up the process of lacing the horizontal thread, called the woof, through the vertical thread, called the warp. 
1784 came the breakthrough that finally corrected the imbalance between spinning and weaving. Edmund Cartwright invented a loom that was steam powered. This power loom took weaving out of the cottage and placed it into factories alongside spinning. Improvements in Cartwright's original power loom continued to be made over the next few years, with an all-metal loom being produced by 1803. By the 1820s, the crisis of weaving capacity had been overcome. The number of power looms in England increased from 900 in 1800 to over 120,000 by 1835. The significance of the revolution in the textile industry was that it made possible cheap fabrics which brought about great increases in the domestic consumption of clothing. With this major achievement, the Industrial Revolution was well on its way to becoming a major turning point in the history of civilization.